Hello, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to uh, start the round in the afternoon here on real-time machine learning and astrophysics. Uh, my name is Peter Nugent, not Ricardo. Um, our first uh, speaker uh, today is Alex Soleil, uh, who is the uh, Centennial Professor in the Department of uh, Physics and Astronomy at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, his work spans a tremendous range in astrophysics, uh, everything from the virtual observatory to large databases, pattern recognition, classification, gravitational lensing, you name it. Uh, he is here today to uh, give us a keynote talk on scalable data intensive statistical computations in astrophysics. Uh, Alex? So, how, it's, how do we do scientific data analysis today? First of all, the data is doubling every year, and we are, this year we are in several different experiments. We are crossing over the petabyte area. And this is, of course, true not just in astrophysics, but in several other domains of science, you know, in the LHC or in genomics. And the other interesting feature is that the data is everywhere, and it will never be in a single location. So we, again, in also physics, you know that we have all the wavelength archives by NASA. Then at the new telescope facilities have their own archives. LSST is underway. Then uh, other experiments are built in their own data centers. At the same time, in this world where we have more and more data, the computer architectures are increasing the CPU having an eye poor. So it's very easy to stick and by hundred more six new CPUs every year, which have more and more cores in them. But our hardest technologies have hardly changed over the last decade. <coughs> I was at Edinburgh last year. There was a workshop on mid science, and one of the speakers, Malcolm Atkinson, has quoted the number that scientists have typically spent 80% of their time on minimal tasks. And a lot of it has to do with data management it's a factor doing science, what, what we are supposed to do. Also, when we do computing, scientists need a lot of special features, which are not so prevalent in commercial computing, which seems to be driving the market these days. So we need areas, and we also need GPUs for computation, not, not just to play computer games. Most of the data analysis today is done on mid-sized variable clusters, typically bought by faculty startups. And these machines end up in good closets because every faculty member wants their own middle empire. They want to put it into a separate computer room and want to have probably a full control. Then, of course, the universities are converting lab labs and, and other rooms into computer rooms. And at some point, the green side is going to start doing that, especially when the different buildings are going to melt down, <laughs> which has happened at Hopkins. <laughs> so we managed to draw the transformer to the this building. So similarly, we installed a lot of new computers, plus a guy who was working in high PC superconductivity. He installed a 250 kilowatt furnace. And that was just too much. <laughs> And so for three months we were on, they brought in three tractor trailers with freezer generators, cables to the thickness of my arm, and the cables were hot as they were coming into the building. So I started to appreciate how much power we are making. <coughs> data is coming at such a rate that soon we cannot even hope to store the incoming data stream. This transition has happened in the LA where we are using hardware triggers to build that. They only keep one in every 10 million events that is coming up of the detectors. And with SKA, it's obvious that we will also be soon get into the class soon, whatever, 10, 15 years. But we are already talking about the time and we just simply cannot store the data. We just have to process the data on the streets as they're coming. So, what we are looking at is a world that is not quite scalable and not quite maintainable. And we have to realize that these changes that are around the corner are not incremental. So simply, we cannot just do a little bit more of what we have been doing before and a little bit better. <coughs> so in a sense, Harry Ford had this quote. If I had asked my customers what they wanted, well, if I, had, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. 
Ja me ei nyt hyvin käyttää se, että maa sitä voisi. Also, we have to realize that science is moving increasingly from hypothesis driven to data driven discoveries. So last summer I was at the bioinformatics workshop in Baltimore. I think Michael was there. And so there was a long discussion after my talk that what is differentiates, for example, astronomy from NIH biological science. And in, to the NIH, you cannot study that proposal even today if it doesn't start with a couple of a priori hypotheses and then you take data to prove or disprove this hypothesis and so on. You cannot put in a proposal, okay, I just want to take the full genome of all my patients or of all these people, and I'm sure I will find something interesting. Okay. Also in this world, when the data is growing basically at the same rate as our computers are growing, we cannot have it. We simply cannot have n squared and n cubed algorithms. We can only have n algorithms, which are where they are. And if the algorithms are such that essentially it's impossible to translate them to n squared, then we have to use randomized randomization, randomized and incremental algorithms, of which there will be a whole lot more in later in the week. And also, we have to fold it into our cost function, the cost of computing. So we have to optimize to get the best result in a given time, not the best overall optimal result, because that may take a lot of time. We also need new computational tools and strategies. So it is not just statistics. So we have to come up with statistical algorithms, which are also computable. And a lot of this trend has been started, actually, at CMU, at Target in now on. So it's Andrew Moore's group and Alex is here from that group. And <coughs> so it is not just statistics, not just computer science, it is not just astronomy, not just genomics, but all of the above. And we also need new computer architectures which are better suited for these computational tasks. And I realized that astronomy, why astronomy is special? And why a lot of these things have started out in astronomy among the sciences first? That astronomy has always been data driven. What does it mean? That we cannot do experiments in the usual sense. In physical sciences, I can have a desktop experiment, and if I get, I get the result, and I go in and change something in the apparatus and do something else, do another experiment. In astronomy, we only simply can do is look at the sky. It's given, and we have done this for thousands of years. So we learned early on that we have to derive even our hypothesis from looking at the data that is out there on the sky. And we cannot proactively interact with the data, only through observing it. And now this is becoming more and more generally accepted, though. <coughs> Anyone knows what this is? That's the first microscope, made by the book. And uh, so basically what we need today is something like that. Like if you know the first microscope, he looks through it and suddenly hits a hole in the and up in front of his eyes. So it's all the bacteria, and then you see some crystal structures. And this is something that we need in a sense in this world of data. We need the equivalent of today's microscope, where we can look at the data and we see all this whole new world that is contained within the sea. But we also need a telescope, so we want to be also able to look at the data from afar to see the patterns, but we have to dig deep into the details simultaneously. So how do we do scalable data in terms analysis? So basically, if we are talking about petabytes, large data sets, it doesn't fit into physical memory. It doesn't even fit on solid state disks. The only way to store all this data today is to store it on regular spinning hard disks, and lots of them, thousands of them. <coughs> Networks are not fast enough to move the data in general, so we have to this is the fact that the analysis have to move where the data is. And this is something that Jim, has, Jim Gray has been saying for a long time. It is also clear that the hard disks are becoming sequential devices. So for a better by data set, if we have a random pattern, we will never finish the analysis. So the only way to do analysis on such data sets is to lay out the data in such a way that we can essentially access the data in a sequential way. And you see where I'm going with this, so sequential streaming. So we basically have to re completely retranspose our scientific analysis framework to adopt streaming technologies. 
And mostly, I want to understand the visualization while we have screening problems. How do we screen the data from the hardest into our CPUs, or how do we screen it from the hardest into our graphics cards? Same thing is true with searches. Look at MapReduce, Hadoop. All they are massively parallel architectures, but what they do, do is basically a very large scale sequential crawling of many, many petabytes or exabytes of data. So basically, they are turning the them into a parallel streaming engine. <coughs> Spatial indexing in sciences, but even on the outside world, we, geospatial is very important, locality is very important, because we want to get a particular data set from its location. So, but this is typically then a random access pattern. So how can we maximum turn a random access pattern and then index access to be maximally sequential the new space scaling curves? And so Chris Saunders also wrote a very seminal paper about 15, 17 years ago, where he studied the clustering properties of all these space scaling curves, and he has shown that basically the down of the other curve has the optimum clustering properties for so, so basically, things which are coherently stored, which are next to one another in higher dimensional spaces on a plan of Hilbert curve, but in general, in all space unit curves are fairly close to one another in a linear sense. So if you map the space unit curve onto the hard disk space, then we, whenever we want to access a region of space at arbitrary scales, then this gives us the best sequential access patterns. While astronomy data. So why is, why is this good to exercise data mining? So first of all, the, we have this traditionally data-driven approach. We have important spatial temporal features. We have very large density contrasted populations. We are now looking for outliers in one in a million. There's first, we did, you know, when I was in grad school, we were looking for outliers in one in a thousand. We have real errors and covariances that we actually understand. Many signals are very subtle and buried in systematics. And data sets are very large and they are pushing our scalability. So this is Jim saying that we, our data is big. And when Jim Gray was asked by Bill Gates why is he spending half his time working with astronomers. So Jim said, I love working with astronomers because the data is worthless. <laughs> and Gates was laughing and said, OK, just go on, because this is very cool. The worst has meant that you know that data can be shared. You don't need lawyers to negotiate a deal with Microsoft, you know, you don't need one disclosure agreement, basically we can play with it. Which is not true for health data, medical data, financial data, corporate stuff. <coughs> so we live in the age of surveys. And when you look at you know what they are, how do we can see and whether it's just a number of pixels. Then in the Angular Galaxy surveys, so basically the difference, we, we have grown link survey that people counted visually galaxies with photographic plates was about 15 years ahead of its time, by the way. So we should have hit the 1 million number only about 85. So if you plot all this exponential, because everywhere you see the exponential, the only outlier is link. So that is way, way ahead of its time. But, and then in Ratchet surveys, we have gone again from 3,000 galaxies to essentially 2 millions. <laughs> but the real explosion is in the time domain, which is happening now. So in the time domain, there's an entirely new dimension that is opening up, where we have all these multi epoch observations, and there are many different surveys on there, already ongoing or, or very shortly. And, and these are all putting out petabytes per year. My personal involvement with this started with the Sloan survey, which was two surveys in one. The only interesting thing here, and I would like to call it out, these were our original goals to, take, to cover two and a half ter terapixels, 10 terabytes, and we expected the catalogs to be about half a terabyte. And the project was supposed to last about six to eight years in 92. In 2000, we haven't even begun. So the project lasted twice as long. And luckily, since it was twice as long, we could, we could afford to be much more ambitious in our data management. So we were able, so these days, when we have to now, the project is, the official software is over, 
part one and two, and the imaging camera has been turned off now. So we have to archive about altogether 120 terabytes of data. We have more than 35 terabytes in the database. So if it wasn't for more small and private small, we could not have done this. But everything was in eight years later, everything was exponentially cheaper. So we could actually afford to be much more ambitious. <coughs> so what are some of the challenges we are faced with? We have the cross match problem. So we observe the sky in many different wave bands. So through many different instruments, through many different resolutions, many different systematics. And we find only we don't have with hundreds and hundreds of epochs or that we are looking at the same spectrum of the sky. Then there is only a limited number of spectra we can get through regular spectrographs and we have seen how photometric redshifts are becoming will be much more efficient in obtaining at least a statistical redshift. We need to study correlation functions. There the challenge is that the correlation algorithm is inherent in S or higher or there. We have the outlier detection problem in many dimensions. Then there's the issue <coughs> that as we were growing up, the older statistical techniques of sunrise learning was techniques to read down all the shot noise because we just didn't have enough objects. So how can we compensate for the small sample size? Today, with hundreds of millions of objects, is <coughs> not an issue. Statistical noise is not an issue by and large. But what is important that increasingly the errors in the surveys and in our analysis are dominated by systematics. And this, in order to get rid or minimize the impact of the systematic errors, requires quite different techniques. How do we compare observations to models? How do we compare ensembles? And also, how can we feed back what we see from the observations into refining our models? This is really a very complex and difficult question that is by far from being solved. And Tony Tyson always likes to say that this is the unsolved problem. So the unknown unknown, that we have no models, no idea, there is some new phenomenon that is so rare that we have not seen anything like it before. And how do we detect it? How can we distinguish it from an observational error? And we have lots of the streams coming. People are talking quite seriously about the square kilometer array. And so overall, we have a scalability problem. <coughs> so I'd like to talk a little bit about two of these. One would be an analysis of spectra and photometric measurements. <coughs> That's actually not so well about the two things. But so in spectra, we have now millions of spectra, for example, just in Sloan, but many other surveys and MOS is coming online or is operating. So basically what we have here is a sparse signal in very large number of dimensions. So we have a typical spectrum is four, six, seven thousand bits of resolution element. And still this signal is embedded usually in a very low dimensional space, as we will see. We have a lot of noise. And we have also some very rare events. If we just wanted to brute force it, so let's say build a PCA on this, this is, by far, this is far from trivial. So a 4,000 by 1 million has really problem. It is still brute force computable today, but it, but it will take a substantial amount of computational resources. So this is a perfect candidate for randomized algorithms. And this motivated our work that I would like to show next is how we build a PCA algorithm or that is incremental and essentially randomized. So this shows that if you build a PC on the small spectra, one can basically, most of the information is contained in a small number of high spectra. So this is what I meant, that the dimensionality of the spectra is not all that large. So, so it's, it's 4,000 resolution elements, but it's basically a five-dimensional signal, by and large five-dimensional signal that is embedded in a 4,000-dimensional space. Okay, how do we compute this? <coughs> so the brute force takes a week on a fairly large compute layer. And so Thomas came up with an idea, and then the initial mission was a most of the copies, so did a very nice implementation. So the idea is that 
instead of computing the whole PC and the whole SVD in one go, we do it little step by step. So we have to have a cold start. So we take a small number of vectors and basically build up a basis. And we only, let's say we only want to keep about five eigenvectors and five eigenvalues. So we build up, we start with a few hundred spectra and we build up such a way of And then we start adding incrementally spectra one by one. And then we say that the new correlation matrix is gamma times the old correlation matrix plus one minus gamma times the outer product of the two vector, of the new vector. So we incrementally add to this. The same way as we could compute an incremental average. For example, that every step along the way we update the average by a little bit. And one can also take a million spectra and we can just start drawing from this million spectra randomly as, as the next one that is perturbing this matrix. And it turns out that after 15,000 spectra, the eigenweight is already has converged in about 15 minutes. It's a computing for a week. So this is quite remarkable. However, there is a problem. There are some outlier spectra where there's something bad happened. And, and so, so there is, for example, some spurious signals that apply something in the spectrum. And when that happens, and then we use this, and that spectrum comes in and perturbs it, the existing basis, it has a huge effect. And it can completely throw the whole basis off into nowhere. And so how can one, so Tomasz could my a nice idea from the so-called robust M scale, so that we can work out essentially instead of building every PCA is essentially solving an L2 minimization problem. And what if we use actually a robust function, robust threshold function, so which starts up as a parabola, but then essentially cuts off either logarithmically or goes to an asymptotically flat value. And the only question is how to find the transition point the so called M scale. And so the idea is that as we do this iterative as we do this iterative transform, <coughs> then we downweight the obvious outliers to not let those to disturb factor the basis too much. And so this is we just a couple of eigenvalues and the color, so the red is the first one, and we start off the basis and then here comes the random perturbation. So, so an add vector. And then in the traditional classic PCA, this would completely throw off the basis, which starts to relax. But then again, another random that spectrum comes and throws it up again, so this will never settle if the error rate is high enough. When we use the robust M scale, here are the outlier events. And you can see that there's a little bit of glitch at every one of them, but basically the system tolerates it very nicely. So, so this is a very stable and fast algorithm. And now there is even a parallel implementation that one can actually go out across multiple servers and do this in parallel. <coughs> so I would like to show two little examples what was used, which were using the secret of BC as the first step in the calculation. One was by Ishwan Chavoy and the other was by in collaboration with Mike Mahoney from Stanford. So this started out with a paper from Candice. So essentially, the principal component were suits. In the standard PCA, we basically minimize if x is our data matrix. We try to minimize x minus e, where we want to say that e is a truncated basis. So the rank is limited to the first x, for the first three eigenvalues. OK, and that's standard. In the principal component were suits, we are trying to separate the signal matrix into two components. N is similar to a standard PCA eigenbasis, so it has a restricted number of smooth eigenvectors. So basically, it's a low dimensional space that is embedded in the vector space. And then A is an additional component which is sparse in the opposite direction. So it is sparse if you think of spectra. The N describes basically the smooth energy space, the spectral energy distribution. And the A describes a small number of pixels where there is a lot of variation. But it is, they are both very sparse signals, but they are sparse in a complementary way. Okay. And then, of course, if we wanted to solve it in an L2 norm, then this is an anti-complete problem. So the trick is to, to do this computation using the L1 norm. 
second let me try to come back to this on top of the soul spectra um, anyway so this is the standard PCA construction of of so the real to the right number of soul spectra and this is the residual after I think five item basis this is in the principal component per suit you can see how nicely it's separated the small suit area of component to protein which basically consists of the typical galaxy spectra with a combination of the kind of smooth spectral energy distribution and the absorption lines, and then completely separates the very sparse emission lines from it. And one can see also the residual is much, much smaller than in the previous case. <coughs> Chingwa has been following them, basically working along the following Mahoney and Dinas where they take another decomposition of a so this is a set of galaxy spectra. So this is wavelengths and this is this is galaxies. So if you take say a sample of typical galaxies, whatever a hundred galaxies here and we have this is the wavelengths, we can decompose it into a left and right set of vectors C and X. And so this is basically describes, so this is around wavelengths, and this is, this is organized around galaxy ideas. Okay. And so we pick a number of eigenvectors that we want to keep, and then we compute the slope and leverage score. A little bit clearer from the next picture. So this is, for example, if we keep two eigenvectors, this is relatively then we look at then we look at basically the sum of the first two eigen so sorry we look at the first two eigenvectors and for every wavelength we compute the squared sum of the respective weights in the eigenvectors. This is what is here. This is for the weight. And as we increase the number of components, you can see we are adding more complexity. But we can see that most of the variance. For example, if we go to six components, six eigenvectors, most of the variance is really con contained in some very distinct ranges of wavelengths. So in a sense, the question is that which parts of the PCA space along the wavelengths we imagine are contributing most of the variance and most of the information. Okay, and in astronomy, this has been studied the hell out. These are called the so-called quick indices. So that we know that if we want to discover, for example, the metallicity or want to measure the metallicity of the galaxy, we look at certain parts of the spectrum. Okay. Question is that can we actually derive this objectively using PC expansion and this and this uh, importance weighting? And so this shows basically these indices, the so-called deep indices, and at the same time this is the computed average score for each of those features, each of those latex regions. And we can see that most of the new features like the D4000, etc., are indeed show up also as the statistically most significant parts. So it's very nice that we are actually reproducing possible astronomy from these techniques. <coughs> and here we can see also so Chihuahua is now playing with various ideas that we find essentially the most sensitive wavelength direction, and then she is also starting to grow these regions out a little bit to see that how wide do we have to go to capture actually the next what is kind of an inflection point in the areas contributed by the future. Photometric redshifts. So basically, taking a spectrum on a telescope is expensive because we disturb the same light, we disperse the same light into many thousands of pixels that we would otherwise capture in using a broadband field term in a CCD. <coughs> so we have seen that galaxies, so one can think of galaxies, if you take broadband colors of galaxies, this can be considered as a very coarse spectrograph. And we can use this to compute the statistical redshift of galaxies. And this is again a high dimensional embedding of a noisy low dimensional process. So that's the galaxy distance from its colors. And it is a solo statistical problem with fairly substantial computational needs. 
And people try different ways. So the people try the training set approach. People also try to get templates. So here is actually kind of the rough idea for how almost for those of you who are not astronomers. So basically, the universe is expanding, expanding is exactly like how so galaxy twice as far moves twice as fast away from us. This one is a shift in the spectral lines. And we can measure the shift of the spectral lines by taking the spectrum and compare the features to the lab spectra. But spectroscopy is very expensive, and future big surveys will have no spectra. So let's use the images to derive force spectra. And there are a whole bunch of techniques. They are, can be categorized in a couple of different groups. One is phenomenological, so basically fitting some surface to the Photometric uh, photometric radio creation using neural network spinning estimators, random forests. We can have template based, we can have <coughs> and then have hybrid techniques like different variants of the baseline methods. Okay. So I would like to talk a little bit about random forests here because they were remarkably played with this over the last two years and they remarkably successful. And it turns out there is a deep connection to Thomas from the paper on unified theory of photometric redshifts, which emphasizes the fact that essentially there is no simple functional relation. So from the colors, it is not a simple one-to-one that means on redshift. For every set of colors, there is still a probability distribution. So it's a basic problem. <coughs> it's not a regression problem. And so he was using camera density estimators in some simple examples, but basically to do this in real life requires very high dimensional integrals to be evaluated. So computationally it is still very expensive. So we did random first and one of our students and Carl has been working on this. And it turns out what is remarkable is that the estimated errors for the random first technique are very, very close to a Whereas for all the other techniques, the errors are very skewed. So we spent some time to figure out why this is. First of all, so in the random forest technique, we take a training set and then we set up a far step wing <coughs> direction. And then we draw maybe a subset, and for each of the subset, we will then have classification or regression tree. First of all, we photometric redshift, the training set itself is dirty. So in every neighborhood there is a good chance if the neighborhood is large enough that there is a dirty point. So therefore if we build that training, if we build a single regression tree of the whole training set, then every neighborhood is going to contain a dirty object, which means that the estimates will be off. If we start picking out of this neighborhood local neighborhoods at say at a 50-60% sampling rate, then if there is for example, one that point in every neighborhood, depends of course on the probabilities, then half the neighborhoods will actually be clean. And so those neighborhoods will have a very nice Gaussian distribution for the regression value. Whereas all the points which contain the dirty points, all the neighborhoods which contain the dirty points will be half in the tail. So typically what we found in the distributions of the three estimators was that we had a nice Gaussian core and then an extended tail, sometimes the second one. Okay. So in any case, for every given query point, each tree picks a neighborhood over the set. So basically, over the set of all the training set points. So imagine that say we have 10,000 points in our training set, and then every tree, and then I have a particular query point. I have a particular neighborhood in this support space, and then every one of the tree picks a certain set of these training set points, in that neighborhood. When I look at the ensemble of all the trees, then they draw and compute that what is the frequency of every one of the points that participates in the, at least one of the kernels, and at least one of the neighborhoods, we get actually a smooth kernel. And by building more trees, we are not changing the shape of this kernel function. All that we do is we sample the kernel a little bit better. But the shape of the kernel is really depending on the strategy, the particulars, how we tune the random forest algorithm, and also what is the overall, how broad the kernel is, mostly depends on the 
effectively brings us freedom, <coughs> which depends on the sampling rate. So therefore, there is a central limit theorem, obviously at work, which is why the estimate for S estimator is close to LCM. But it is not the number of trees, it is not the number of comets. It is actually the width of the scale now. So it is very nice to not be onto the kernel regression problem that Thomas outlined, except that this is easy to compute. And we have heard the talk, so this is, by the way, the result. So for an inspect and the Vermont class, and this is the error of normalized residual distribution. So it's, it has a little skewness, but, but it is much better than anything else out there. And we did a hardware implementation of this, literally. So we found also that R was not very good on managing memory. So Sam has rewritten the random forest, the estimation part of the random forest code in C sharp, and then actually then first, and then in CUDA. And we used a bunch of little motherboards as an experiment. So these are hundred dollar motherboards, which have a little, little 16 set of 16 cores of GPU, just enough to put, just enough to run an HD codec with our home TV motherboards. And 36 of these cost about the whole cost was less than 30k, but most of the money has gone into the solid state disks. So we were able to run a 1.2 terabyte data set. So all the phone galaxies with photometry, we were running 50 trees per object. And so this means 6.4 million uh, multidimensional regressions in 5 million on this little cluster. So this means that you know this is actually a pretty scalable solution. So terabytes of data, millions of objects, minutes of compute time for for basically a system that if we package it a little nicer and compute on their desk. And the whole thing runs on one kilowatt. Okay, correlation function is the third thing I'd like to talk about. <coughs> because of the scalability. We have two, so the correlation functions come in many shapes and colors, two three point higher order spatial angular, and we have various estimators, direct estimators, edge corrections, and we have three codes, so Alex has spent most of his PhD in writing beautiful three codes for higher order correlation function. We also power shots on DPU based codes. And we also sometimes compute power spectra. And what we only do is that the two are equal and one another. And we are directly, this has the advantage that this power spectra are directly related to linear theory, etc. And what we are connected to the theory is this. And but most of the time, 95% of the time, the theory is 2.76. And we use angular spatial correlation functions, also using the regression space. And basically, this is these are the typical estimators. If we had an over density field, this would be the correlation function between two points x1 and x2. And for a homogeneous out of perfect random field, it only depends on this distance. And the simplest estimator is that we basically take the density of the two points. Divide it with the mean density and subject one. And this is symbolic, symbolically then denoted as PD, data, data divided by random, random. Random, random meaning that we kind of build the computer mean densities from data sets which are multi color realizations of all the selection effects in the data. <coughs> it turns out that these two estimators are not equivalent to one another. But that's sort of a longer story. Edge effects are becoming important. And Brian Whitney has, again, written a book about different estimators, how to correct for the edges. Because it turns out that if I have points close to the edge, this object should not be counted in a correlation estimator by the same amount, by the same rate as the ones right in the middle, which have the whole neighborhood inside the survey area. That is, this only has a quarter, and this only has a half. So basically, what is the right weighted speed to use? And Steve Landy and I came up with a rather nice way that we could from the estimator using two different edge corrected estimators. And then <coughs> the edge correction error is first order in both of those. And we created an interference, a difference between those two estimators so that the first order error cancels out 
so the signal and the signal we have of the very good and the security of that. So we implemented this for a particular problem, looking for the sign of the acoustic oscillation signal in the universe in the sound data. And it turns out, we first looked at using the free code. And it turned out that in order to see what we are looking for in the two-dimensional correlation function, this is the line of sight, and this is the transverse reaction in the sky. So this is that we are looking into the sky in this direction, and in the plane of the sky in the other. We were looking at a fairly sharp signal here. And it turns out that in the three codes, you, the three codes work very well if you can, if, if basically your resolution of the correlation function is comparable to your typical cell sizes. And here we did a so one megaparsec resolution over a scale of hundreds of megaparsecs. So basically, the, and the typical galaxy box is facing with about five megaparsec. So we needed to have a tree where all of the small galaxies were essentially down on the tree level, on the leaf nodes of the tree level. So the tree goes did not give us very much of an improvement. Then, the, since the gas, we have almost a million galaxies, we needed to do a large Monte Carlo to compute all the, the geometric corrections. In the end, we needed to compute 600 trillion galaxy X. So the way we did this in the end was to use GPUs. And we first tried to run the GPUs, the tree code on the GPUs, and this didn't work as well. First of all, because the GPUs don't have branch code branching and pollution of the feature as well. So it turned out the simplest thing was to come up with the 15 line kernel, which was just completely all the distances simply period. And run it, submit it, saturate it, all the threads, all the kernels on the GPU. And then it took a couple of days on a single desktop GPU, completely the 600 trillion galaxy <coughs> distances. So there was a lesson in humility. So I was preaching that you can only use S N algorithms or N log algorithms in the scalable world. But when you have a prefactor which is 100,000, then that also comes for something. So what can I afford you with S squared code? If you can partition the problems in so many parallel threads that essentially the prefactor, you, you can then larger the prefactor. So this is massively parallel, but still can still go a long way. Okay. Last bit. Reading petabytes. You can ask, okay, what does this have to do with statistical computations? I would argue that it has to go out. Once we have petabytes, even a simple database query is in many ways a statistical problem. Very often, with the queries, you compute statistical aggregates. Okay, we don't want every, necessarily every row in the result set unless it's kind of an outlier in the top end in some way. So, so the databases are good at that, giving the precise answer. But if you, if you have petabytes and every row has a certain error in it, then do we really want that this a perfect answer? I don't think so. And, we, and I think we, I can imagine many situations where we would be willing to train this last time for basically a control accuracy and an uncertainty quantification. And so one of my students has been working on such a system. So we can run something on top of the parallel database cluster where we break things up the data into little files. <coughs> and basically we can then query run the query on the set of files, like we have reduce. The only thing is that if we have actually a sparse sample built over the set of files, then we can run first and the query on the sparse sample files set and figure out that which files are the most relevant. If I was just randomly selected from the files, as I cover more and more of the data, then we would converge to the real result with the square root of 1 over square root of n. Okay, so we would use central limit theory to converge to the final result. Okay, but if we actually know the relevance of the different files, we can find the better trajectories through this, the better traversals through all these files that you can reach, say, 99% confidence much faster than just going by square root of n. And so Nolan, <coughs> this was his PhD thesis, he has the framework working, and now we are just talking to the most of the previous things. 
for what sampling strategies to use, which is far from trivial, because typically astronomy data sets are very skewed. So the simple random sampling doesn't work because they all imagine that they have a table that's a million zeros and one one. If I randomly sample, I will never hit the one in the sample. But there are all sorts of linear transformations. Imagine I Fourier transform this table. I have a huge spike. So if I Fourier transform, which is just a linear transformation, then afterwards I randomly sample the Fourier coefficients. Then I would already, after a small number of Fourier coefficients, I could already see that the table somewhere has a big spike in it. And from the phases, I can figure out where the spike is approximately. So one can imagine that doing linear transformations from some of these data that's very possible that sampling in that space, we can actually have much better converting strategies. And we can remove the skewer. And how do we visualize satellites? That's yet again another streaming problem. And they are becoming dynamic, and it is clear that even right up today we are streaming the data that our visualization hardware is. That's not going to work with satellites. We have to put the visualization hardware also where the data is. And in a year or so, probably every device, every mobile device in the world will be able to receive a high definition 3D video stream. Okay, so we will have enough bandwidth to actually see the results of such a visualization. So we can, and today we can build individual servers with actually data rates that can actually do such a visualization. So let me show a few pictures. <coughs> this was done by Kai Berger, who visited Hopkins for a summer. And we have a 30 terabyte turbulence database. And he built a little streaming visualization engine that streamed the data directly from the WIS into, I'm not saying the movie, it's just the pictures. So it is a thousand view visualization after a thousand view turbulence simulation. And these are the, he loaded the mouse to here. On the fly, computed the velocity gradient tensor and computed it, the invariant corresponding to the vorticity. And this is explaining the vorticity. <laughs> This is another close up of this. You can see that some of these are pretty spectacular. But the beauty of this is that this was nothing was pre computed. We streamed the raw data from the simulation into a GPU card and it was visualized on the fly as the data was flowing in a multiple gigabytes a second. And we can do this in massively parallel way. <coughs> and the last bit is on the architecture. Super who wrote make and for friend. Uh, well, sorry, the next thing for people is about trade-offs. So what are the trade-offs in this new world that we should make in terms of our hardware? We need, if we have petabytes of data, we need lots of total storage. If we have lots of total storage and we, have, we don't have Google's budget for it, we rely on the NSF, we have to be very really customized. So we have to buy cheap disks and cheap servers. If we have the data and know the list, we have to be able to read it. So the system has to have a high sequential I.O. If we can read the data, then we have to be able to process these streams. And we need fast stream processing, and ideally we would also like to have low power. And of course it's a moving target and every year it will be different. But so a year ago, a year and a half ago, I put a proposal to the NSF to build such a system. I call it data soap. We got there by almost to build something under a million dollars that would have several petabytes. In, in, the, in the end, the final system ended up to have about six and a half petabytes. And this is the streaming data rate. I can do half a terabyte a second. Just for, for reference, the Denver system in Oak Ridge Bend has about 200 gigabytes per second. And that's a 200 million dollar cost system. <coughs> And also, every of the nodes has actually a GPU in it. I did not include it in the price, because that, in a sense, that's the icing on the cake. But we can stream the data directly into the GPUs in the system. So this is something that is actually <coughs> buildable by a typical university group. And operating it is also not that much power, so it's only 180 kilowatts. Summarizing. We need multi real multi-petabyte solutions. 
So the algorithms that we build and the systems that we build and everything that we do needs to scale to the multiple petabytes because this is the data that is coming in today. If we can't do it, we are dead in the water. <coughs> we cannot buy this off the shelf, so we have to do it ourselves. We have these multiple challenges. So this is not just against statistics, this is not just system architecture, this is not just algorithms, not just astronomy, it's all of the other ones. We learned the hard way with the virtual observatory and in general that adopting new approaches is a very difficult process. More difficult than just the technological parts of it. We need to train people with the new skill sets, and I like to paraphrase this as many high shaped people. Traditional scientists are high shaped, we are very narrow and medium layer on this screen. And clearly, we need people who are high shaped, who are neat at least in two different areas. One is on science, and the other is one of statistics and computer science. And we have to try train those people early. <coughs> we also see an increase in diversification everywhere that we do. In terms of software and approaches, a few years ago, if you go to the aggregator, we just have a few frameworks. Today, you see a whole slew of things from memory to other and all sorts of more simple stuff. We also see many common patterns across all disciplines. Namely, everybody likes to control and specify this computer, but no one likes to do data management. And as a result, we don't have any important and nice management system that we can all share with you. And what we see, in any case, right in front of our eyes, we see a new force paradigm of science emerging. But it is clear that this is not the